Take your Bibles. We are ready for Joshua chapter 7. So open your Bibles to Joshua chapter 6. Just seeing if you're paying attention. I meant that, Joshua chapter 6. As you're turning to Joshua chapter 6, does anyone recognize the name Vinko Bogataj? B-O-G-O-T-A-J. Bogataj? Anybody recognize that name? Uh, Some of our uh, middle-aged and up, you should recognize the name because he became famous and was seen every single week from 1971 until 1988. Those were the years where there was a program called ABC's Wide World of Sports. How many of you remember watching that? That was fun because you got to watch the best of the best and the worst of the worst in the week in an hour in clips. And I mean, for a guy that really didn't care much for baseball because it moved too slow, and you just got play, 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 play. That worked good for my attention span. And so I enjoyed that. I liked the show. Uh, How do we know Vinko Bogataj? Jim McKay was the announcer for the opening theme of the show, and he would say, the thrill of victory. And then they'd show all these great clips of, of spectacular catches and throws and events that happened in sports. And then they would say, and the agony of defeat. And that's how we knew Vinko Bogataj. For 27 years, ABC's Wide World of Sports would always put up a different montage of video for the thrill of victory. But for 27 years, nobody forgot Victor Bogataj because it was seen every week as he crashed and burned, so to speak. Uh, It was at the World Ski Flying Championships in Obersdorf, Germany. And as he's coming down that ramp, I mean, he wiped out. And it was a spectacular wipeout. And his legs and skis and everything went all over the place as he goes off of the side. And every time you'd see that, it's like you'd feel yourself cringe every week. You knew it was going to happen, and you'd cringe. Ooh. Once again, you know, you felt it. You felt his pain. Joshua chapter 6 that we saw last week was the thrill of victory. Joshua chapter 7 is the agony of defeat. Most people know full well the thrill of victory. They know Joshua chapter 6. They know about the walls coming down. But when you talk about Joshua chapter 7, that's a little bit more obscure of a story. So let's start, though, in Joshua chapter 6, because it's going to uh, lay out some important things that we're going to need to get into this this morning. In Joshua chapter 6, starting in verse 16, And it came to pass at the seventh time when the priests blew the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, Shout, for the Lord hath given you the city. For the city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed when ye take of the cursed thing, and make the camp of Israel cursed, and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord, They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted when the priest blew with the trumpets, and it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, ox and sheep and ass with the edge of the sword, jumped to verse 24, and they burnt the city with fire, and all that was therein... Only the silver and the gold and the vessels of brass and iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. As we look at that, the instructions seem to be very clear, don't they? But what we want to see this morning, if you're keeping notes, the very first point we want to look at is disobedience. Because disobedience is about to be revealed, in Scripture at least, in chapter 7 and verse 1. The Bible says, but the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of victory. The thrill of victory in chapter 6, the agony of defeat 
in Joshua chapter 7 and verse 1. The anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. There's a couple of points I want to bring out about this disobedience here. The first point is this. How tempting would it have been for us to say, to dismiss what Achan did, and say, it's not that big a deal, is it? I mean, he just took us some stuff that these people aren't going to need anymore, and maybe we shrug our shoulders just a little bit, and we say, it's not, what difference does it make? He didn't take anything from his fellow Jew. I mean, these are the enemy of Israel, right? So what difference is it going to make? They're not going to miss it, they're dead. And I mean, that seems like a logical justification for going ahead and taking a few things as you're going through and you're pillaging the city. Well, a little bit for me, that wouldn't hurt. And so can you kind of picture this? Because Achan knows he's not supposed to take it. And as he tucks a little bit into his, under his robe or something, I don't know how he smuggled it out. The Bible doesn't even tell us how much that he smuggled out. But you know, herein lies the problem. The Israelites, were they told not to take anything for themselves? Okay, Were they told that taking of cursed things would make them cursed? Were they told that that curse would also be on the nation of Israel? And yet they did it anyway. Christian, this morning, does God give us his word to obey? Are we expected to obey all of it or just the parts that we've cherry-picked for ourselves? Are we told that there are consequences for disobedience? Then why are we surprised when those consequences happen. The disobedience that has taken place here. uh, Here's the problem that Achan had, and you know what? We have the exact same problem. I will guarantee you that, that probably most of us that are here, we do not have an issue with knowing what we should do and what we shouldn't do. 95, 98% of the things we know that we should do and we don't do them are the things that we shouldn't do And those things we do. We don't need somebody telling us that we shouldn't do those things. We know that we shouldn't, right? So why do we do them? The difference between knowing what's the right thing to do and doing what's right is the exact same problem that Achan had, and it's the exact same problem that I have, and it's the exact same problem that you have. You know what it is? It's the heart. It is the heart. You will have people whine and they will bellyache and they will say, oh, I know what God wants me to do and I know I'm under God's consequences for what I've done. And wah, 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 wah. And can't under, oh, I know I need to do better. And so once the tears dry up, they don't do any better. Why? It's a heart issue. It's a heart issue. Turn your Bible to Luke chapter 11. Keep a marker here if you haven't lost it already. In uh, Joshua 7, go with me to Luke chapter 11 and verse 28. Luke chapter 11, verse 28. Jesus Christ himself says, but he said, yea, rather blessed are they that hear the word of God, finish it out, and keep it. So we are not only supposed to be hearers of the word, but we are supposed to be Doers of the word. The problem that gets us because we can't get from hearing to keeping, there's something in the middle that's not right. And what's in the middle is our heart. And Christian, this morning, if you look at your life and as we start right out with this disobedience, maybe it's immediately conviction is hitting you and you're going, oh, he knows. I don't know anything. I, I know most of you knew that already. I really don't. I don't know what's going on in your life. Nobody whispered in my ear this morning and said, oh, preacher, I hope you got a good one for my husband or for my wife. They really need it. Nobody has said that. But the Holy Spirit of God right now, as we're dealing with disobedience, the Holy Spirit of God right now is pricking at your heart. And you know there's sin there. You say, how can I get to the point where I do right? We're going to be talking about that throughout the entire message. But I tell you right now, it's a heart issue. It's not an issue with your actions, although those need to change. It's not an issue with your thought pattern, although that needs to change. It's ultimately an issue with the heart. When the heart changes, everything else changes. Because the heart, or excuse me, everything else follows what the heart is leading. So that's what we got to take care of. So the first part under this point of disobedience is that the temptation is there that we shrug things off. Christians, how often do we shrug off our own sin? How often do we do that? You know how you know 
that you're quick to shrug off your own sin when you're quick to point out the sin of everybody else. That's how you know that you're shrugging off your own because I haven't met anybody yet, including the person I saw in the mirror this morning, that had it all together. But boy, we sure can't find each other's faults, can't we? I mean, they're glaring. Wow. I, I would imagine you could list a few this morning, couldn't you? Don't do that, but I imagine we could. What we need to do is tear that list up, start working on our own list about ourselves personally. Don't shrug off our own sin. The second thing is this. In fact, uh, I would encourage you, I want to give you some little uh, nugget phrases. Maybe write these down. Here's the phrase. Consequences are contagious. Consequences are contagious. The reason that consequences, consequences are contagious is for this next little phrase. You never sin alone. You never sin alone. Honestly, I am really tired of mentioning COVID, but it sure supplies a wonderful illustration. We have spent over a year socially distancing and wearing masks and washing our hands like crazy and using hand sanitizer and uh, pretty much avoiding anything remotely suspicious, real or imagined, just because we don't want COVID. But yet we're not that conscious about sin. And sin is more contagious than COVID. A whole lot more contagious than COVID. In, the, in your Bible, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, the Apostle Paul tells this church, he says, your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven, leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed. When we permit what we would call that little sin, and that's a bad thing to call it because there's no such thing as a little sin, sin is sin, Right? But we say it's just, it's just in this small little compartmentalized place in my life and it can't affect anything. Yes, it does. Leaven affects the entire lump. Now look at the people that you are sitting with today. I, as I look across the auditorium, vast majority of you, you are sitting with family, right? So as you look across the pew, maybe just take a glance real quick. That's all right. You can break eye contact up here. Glance who you're sitting with. Do you recognize that your sin, the leaven that is in your life, that it is going to be contagious and it is going to spread across your lump? Your lump being your family. And if it is going to spread across your family, guess what it's also going to do? It's going to spread across this family. And you know what? It's going to not only spread across this family, but it's going to spread across the family of God in its entirety. Why are the American churches where they are at today? As a whole, if it was something that is just contained in a local congregation, the, the compromises and things like that, then it wouldn't spread. But sin has a contagious factor about it. It does spread. It taints. The stuff that is coming out of the Christian colleges today, the things that are coming out of even the Christian schools, the things that are coming out of the secular colleges and the schools, it is tainting the church. And it's rapidly spreading. It is rapidly spreading. You never sin alone. All of Israel stood guilty before God because of the sin of Achan. I'm reminded in the book of Nehemiah that when Nehemiah heard about his beloved city and how his beloved city was in ruins, that he fell on his face and his, his face is wet with his tears and his heart is broken. And as he cries out to God and he says, we have sinned. And it's like, now wait a second, Nehemiah, you didn't sin against your nation. You were in captivity. You didn't do anything. But he identified why. Because of the contagious factor of sin. You never sin alone. 
Disobedience is something serious. And you know, I think that we, we need chapters like Joshua chapter 6 because we need to see what God can do. We need to see great victory. But we need chapters like Joshua chapter 7 to remind us that our sin is just a little thing, right? Just a little bauble, a little trinket, a little souvenir. Maybe Mrs. Aiken says, honey, bring me back a souvenir from the battle. So he's looking around. He says, well, I bet she'd like that. I bet she'd like that. Oh, I bet, and I'd like that, and I'd like that. You know, oh, there's the keys to the chariot. Nobody will miss that. Just a little sin. It was as contagious as it could possibly be. Because it leads us to the second point. Go to Joshua 7, verse 2. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Bethaven, on the east side of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up, and they viewed Ai, and they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai, and make not all the people to labor thither, for they are but a few. So there went up thither the people, about three thousand men, and they fled before the men of Ai, and the men of Ai smote them, about thirty and six men. For they chased them from before the gate, even unto Shebarim, and smote them in the going down whereof the hearts of the people melted and became as water. We have the disobedience that leads us to the defeat. The defeat. Ai is just a little tiny outpost in comparison to mighty Jericho. Jericho went down without a problem. In Ai, the children of Israel are routed. Now think about something here. The plan to defeat Jericho was illogical, and they won. The plan to defeat Ai was logical, and they lost. What was the difference? The difference was that the battle plan to defeat Jericho was God's plan. The battle plan to defeat Ai was man's plan. You don't find any place wherever that Joshua prayed and asked God for direction. Instead, he sent his spies, said, figure this out, guys. What should we do? They come back with a report. Sounds good. Let's do it. How did they defeat Jericho? There was the appearance of the Lord to, to Joshua. There was the falling on his face before the Lord. There was the calling of the people to sanctify themselves, to get up for this great battle. And boy, we saw God do something miraculous and awesome Ah, this is just little old AI. We don't need to pray about that. How much of a difference do you suppose would have been made had Joshua prayed about it and said, God, what's the plan here? So that God might have been able, I don't know if God would have, I don't know how God would have done this, but so God might have told Joshua, Joshua, you go into this battle and people are going to die. But you don't read that. The defeat that takes place here. Go with me to the book of Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs chapter 20. In Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 18. In Proverbs chapter 20 verse 18, every purpose is established by counsel and with good advice. Make war. <laughs> Did Joshua get good advice? Before he made war? Nope. You know why? Because he got man's advice. He didn't get God's. You know, you can go to people and you should get people that would give you good, strong, biblical, godly counsel. The book of Proverbs talks about that. But ultimately, you go to God. Ultimately, you go to God's Word. You find chapter and verse. You ask God to give you His peace on the matter so that you know what you ought to do. You just don't read that happening here when this defeat takes place. How many of our plans fail for lack of prayer? How many times have we entered into our day and we have never once asked God to direct our steps? We just, I mean, the, the alarm goes off, we moan and we groan as we get out of bed and we think, oh, it's the same time every morning I get up at this time, here's my routine. We do our routine and never stop to ask God, okay, God, what's your plan for today? We have ours. 
We have our schedule. We know what we're supposed to do. We know where we're supposed to be. God, what's your plan for today? And then if we do that, how open are we to God changing that plan? So we have the disobedience, we have the defeat. Go back to Joshua 7. Now we're going to have the despair. The despair in verse 6, Joshua rent his clothes and fell on the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the eventide. He and the elders of Israel and put dust upon their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us unto the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Would to God that we had been content and dwelt on the other side of Jordan. O Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it and shall environ us around and cut off our name from the earth. And what wilt thou do unto thy great name? And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get up. I know that's not King James, but get up. Wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? I like his response, don't you? As you read that, that's not the most spiritual prayer Joshua could have offered. Joshua's blaming God. God, how could you? How could you allow this? It would have been better if we had just been left back in captivity. Who does that sound like? That sounds like the Israelites of old that are now dead in the wilderness and their carcasses are there rotting. And here's Joshua praying kind of the same things. Let's go to the book of Job, chapter 34. You know, God sure gets blamed for a lot of stuff, doesn't he? We say, well, I know that God could have done something different or he could have kept something from happening. Therefore, it's God's fault because it happened. Oh, Christian, be very, very careful. God doesn't deserve to be blamed for anything. In Job chapter 34, verse 18. Is it fit to say to a king, thou art wicked, and to princes, ye are ungodly? How much less to him that accepteth not the persons of princes, nor regardeth the rich more than the poor? For they all are the work of his hands. How much more unfitting is it, if you wouldn't say it to a king or to a prince, how much more unfitting is it to blame God? And then go over to chapter 40. Look at verse 6. Chapter 40, verse 6, Then answered the Lord unto Job out of the whirlwind, and said, Gird up thy loins now like a man. I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. Wilt thou also disannul my judgment? Wilt thou condemn me, that thou mightest be righteous? Wow. Have we ever been guilty of blaming God? Of being angry with God? God, it's your fault. Why did you let that happen? You know, it puts our theology to the test really, really quick, quickly. We have to make a decision. Do we believe that the God who cannot be tempted with evil according to James, that he is somehow tempting us with evil? Where's our theology? Do, believe, do we believe that God is acting righteously or not? Do we believe that God knows what he's doing or not? If our theology is right, and it should be, then we know that there has to be reasons for what is happening. The reason is not to blame God. It's not God's fault. There has to be another answer to it. Job should have been, or not Job, but Joshua should have been on his face saying, God, I need wisdom. Why did this happen? What did I do wrong? What did we as a nation do wrong? Why did we lose? It isn't God's fault. Maybe you're here this morning and you're really going through some things, and, I, and quite honestly, you could be here in church this morning and you're just a little angry with God and you're going to say, I can show him. I can go to church even when I'm angry with him. Well, you know what? God knows your heart. Don't be angry at God. Recognize that God is holy. He is righteous. He is perfect. He does no wrong. He does no sin. There is nothing that has happened that God is worthy in the least little bit of 
to be blamed. Recognize that this morning. You know, even the lost soul in hell cannot blame God and say, God, you tricked me. God, you weren't fair to me. God, you gave me no choice. The lost soul in hell can't even say that. They made their decision against him. He had no choice but to act judiciously and righteously when he said, depart from me, I never knew you. He has no other choice. God's not at fault. So we have, the, we have all these things that are happening. What follows the despair? What happens after God saying, get up, Joshua? <laughs> I just love that. That is just, that is good. Get up, Joshua. We are laying here on the floor for boo-hooing about this. It's time for action. There is a reason this is happening. So let's talk about the discovery. Joshua chapter 7, verse 11. Israel hath sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant which I commanded them. For they have even taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen and dissembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you any more, except you destroy the accursed from among you. Up, sanctify the people, and say, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow, for thus saith the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel. Thou canst not stand before thine enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought according to your tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord taketh shall come according to the families thereof, and the family which the Lord shall take shall come by household, and the household which the Lord shall take shall come man by man. And it shall be that he that is taken with the accursed thing shall be burnt with fire, he and all that he hath, because he hath transgressed the covenant of the Lord, because he hath wrought folly in Israel." So Joshua rose up early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes, and the tribe of Judah was taken. He brought the family of Judah, and he took the family of the Zerahites, and he brought the family of the Zerahites man by man, and Zabdi was taken, and he brought his household man by man, and Achan, the son of Camry, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was taken. Isn't that wild to think about that? I mean, Christians, let's be honest. Don't we try to hide our sin? And where did we learn that from? You go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, and there's only two hiding from God. Oh, God will never find me. There's only two of you. And so here's Achan. He's thinking, my odds are better than Adam and Eve's. It, roughly, there could have been anywhere from one and a half to two million Jews total. That's a big group to hide in. You ever play that or see those Where's Waldo books? You know, there's a Where's Aiken book, and, and God will never find me in the middle of this. Uh, it's kind of like trying to find a single person on a big sky cam in the middle of New York City. Oh, they'll never find me. And as this all works out, this is amazing. One chance in two million that they pick you. Wait a minute. Joshua just divided the tribes. The mathematical simplicity of this is staggering because now, let's say there was 2 million people, you divide 2 million by 12, that puts 166,667 in each tribe. So now we're down to 1 out of 166,667. Don't quote me on the numbers, I don't know the numbers, I'm making the numbers up, all right? It's the odds. The odds are incredible. But now it goes down to the family, then to the household, then man to man, and then Achan. Go with me to the book of Numbers, chapter 32. Numbers, chapter 32. Now, you're going back to Numbers, chapter 32. So this is truth that Achan would have already had, along with all the children of Israel. Numbers, chapter 32, verse 23. It says, but if ye will not do so, behold, ye have sinned against the Lord. Finish that out with me, please. And be sure your sin will find you out. Do we believe that? Be sure your sin will find you out. What are you trying to hide from God today? And again, I don't have any clue. But you know. 
you know, we can work this right up, kind of right up the ladder. So the kids that are left in here that aren't back in junior church, what are you hiding from mom and dad? What are you hiding from a teacher at school? Let's take it up to mom and dad. Dad, what are you hiding from mom? Mom, what are you hiding from dad? Let's take it farther. You go to work, you've got an employer. What are you hiding from your boss? Let's take it higher. What are you hiding from the IRS? (laughs) Isn't it amazing how we think we can get away with it? Increase the numbers and the odds of not being found out get greater and greater and greater. And you say, yeah, but what about those criminals? They've killed somebody, they buried the body, and the body isn't found until, you know, decades after the individual dies that killed the person. And you say, well, they didn't get found out. We like to always think that our greatest place of accountability is here. And this isn't our greatest place of accountability, folks. God is our greatest place of accountability. And he knows absolutely no secrets. Or you don't have any secrets that you can keep from him. Maybe there's a better way to say it. You can't keep anything from God. He sees every bit of it. No action, no thought, no imagination, no whispered word. Nothing hidden by the blue screen of your tablet, your computer, your phone. Nothing can be kept from the Lord. He knows everything. And so as we finish out this passage here in Joshua chapter 7, we had better make sure that we are doing business with God before God has to do serious business with us. Joshua chapter 7, verse 19. Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him, and tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a, a goodly Babylonish garment and 200 shekels of silver and a weight of gold and 50 shekels of weight, then I coveted them and took them, and behold, they are hidden the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. And Joshua sent messengers, and they ran into the tent, and behold, it was hid in his tent and the silver under it. And they took them out of the midst of the tent and brought them unto Joshua and unto all the children of Israel and laid them out before the Lord. The fourth point is, or fifth point is disclosure. We've got to give Achan some props here. As you read the passage, Achan essentially says, I saw, I coveted, I took, I hid. I did this. I sinned. We've got to give him credit for that. But he doesn't confess until he gets caught. And then he fesses up. Why wait till that long? Why didn't he confess immediately when he found out that God knew? Why didn't he already know that God knew? Why didn't conviction overwhelm him? Christians, I'm not pointing a finger at Achan. Because Achan's not any different than you and I. Again, what sin are we keeping away from God? What sin have we trivialized in our life? And we have said this isn't really a sin. It's not something to be dealt with, all that kind of stuff. Here's all the stuff. And when you read what he took, how did he get that under his robe? That's a lot of stuff. So did he wear an extra large garment that day? So he had a place, did he have this planned out that he was going to take some stuff? So he had a place to tuck it? I don't know. You know, you got to imagine. How did he get that stuff out of there and nobody else noticed? I, I, I picture when the, uh, you remember in Peter Pan, when Shmi has got all the jewels and everything, and he's got tucked up in his robe and he's running, and Captain Hook's calling him back, and he's going, Shmi, Shmi, what about Shmi? And he's got all of his, you never seen it, have you? Okay, we just have to take the word for it. That's the picture that I get as he's hustling back to the tent, and they're digging a hole to hide this stuff. How in the world did nobody notice but his family knew, and God knew more importantly. Which takes us to the final point, Joshua 7, verse 24. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver, and the garment, and the wedge of gold, and his sons, and his daughters, and his oxen, and his asses, and his sheep, and his tent, and all that he had. And they brought them unto the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? 
The Lord shall trouble thee this day, and all Israel stoned him with stones and burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones unto this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger, wherefore the name of the place was called the Valley of Achor unto this day. The final point is the discipline. Here's another thing to jot down, just a simple phrase. Confession doesn't terminate consequence. Confession doesn't terminate consequence. There was consequences attached to what Achan had done. God said, here's the consequences. And you say, yeah, but, you know, we get a little bit of a, a, a liberal light heart and we go, well, yeah, but why the family too? Because the family knew and they did nothing about it. And you say, well, yeah, but what family member is going to turn their own family member in? It goes back to who do we love the most? Do we love Achan the most or do we love God the most? Because God's the one that said, don't do this because you're going to bring a curse down on all of the nation of Israel and 36 people died because of one man's actions and because of the inaction of his family. 36 people died. You know what that's called? That is called capital punishment. And that's what was enacted. God ordained that. You know, as you look at that in Scripture, you say, oh, that was, that was Old Testament. Oh, that's hideous stuff. Oh, blah, 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 blah. It's in the New Testament too. Why do you think in the book of Romans chapter 13, the Bible says that those who wield the sword don't wield it in vain? There is something to be feared. A life, 36 lives have been taken. You say, oh, but then you're saying Achan couldn't be forgiven? I didn't say that. I am saying that confession doesn't terminate consequences. You know, the, the, the individual who, and I can remember Tom Harris telling this story many, many years ago up at World Life Screen Lake, and he was telling about an individual that had lived a, a, a drug-addicted life, and now they had AIDS because of all the uh, needles and stuff that they had put into their veins. And this individual had been witnessed to and witnessed to and witnessed to and witnessed to. And finally, this individual came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. And their life was instantaneously changed by the grace of God. But they still died of AIDS. Why? Because confession doesn't terminate consequence. And Christian, you and I, that's where we have got to recognize that we say, oh, it's just a small sin. I remember a fellow by the name of Moses in the scripture, and all he did was got angry at the children of Israel. He smacked a rock twice when he wasn't even supposed to do it. And he says, must we provide this for you? And God says, you aren't going into the promised land. I thought that was a fairly small thing that he did. I was proud of Moses that he didn't smack the people with the stick and see if water would come out of them. God says, that's not what I told you to do. Obedience to God's word is that important, folks. That we are specifically obedient to him, not, not manipulating and adjusting his word to make it comfortable for where I'm at and what I want to do, to somehow give me a way to do the things I want to do. God demands holiness, Christian, out of every single one of our lives. And that means that we walk a walk that is so close in obedience to the word of God that we get away from that imaginary line. And we say, Lord, I want to draw close to you. Consequences. Christian, are there consequences in our life? If you, we're not going to do this, but if you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and you remember the individual that was involved in just heinous immorality, immorality in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, I mean, just gross immorality. And God said to take such a one and to deliver that individual unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the soul would be saved. Didn't mean that person was lost. But it meant that there was a consequence that went along with their sin. And there are consequences that go along with our sin. Again, I don't know if or who I'm talking to. I do know that Christians, we've got to examine our own personal life. 
We need to be right with God. The thrill of victory is what I want. I don't want the agony of defeat. (laughs) I don't want to be Victor crashing at the end of the ski ramp. I want to be the one that does the great things for the Lord. How about you? But if sin's in our life, it's not going to happen. And if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, this there are things you can take out of this and apply to your life. The Bible says that all have sinned. You say, I'm glad I haven't done nothing like Achan. I'm glad I haven't killed anybody. I'm glad I haven't this, this, this. You name off all the things you haven't done. What you haven't done is made God first in your life by accepting His Son, Jesus Christ, as Savior. You have broken the first of the Ten Commandments. If you have broken one of God's laws, James says you are guilty of all of them. Every single one of them. So, lost person this morning, there's consequences to your sin. The wages of sin is death. You say, well, we're all going to die. I've been to enough funerals where everybody's going to die. You're right. It's point unto men wants to die. But where are you going to be after you die? A split second after you're dead, where are you going to be? If you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, absent from the body and the presence of the Lord. Lost person, where are you going to be? Think about that. You say, well, I'll get things right then. Where do you see that in the Bible? Now's the accepted time. Now's the day of salvation. Jesus Christ paid the price and the penalty for your sins in His blood as He hung on Calvary's cross. And He dies on that cross. Gives His life up. He's buried in the tomb. And after three days and three nights, He takes His life up again. He arises from the grave with the power to give new life to all who will believe. Lost person, that's what you need this morning. We would love to take you aside, open God's Word, and introduce you to Jesus. Would you come this morning? Stand with me, please, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Our Heavenly Father, this morning, as we come into this time of invitation, we have got some things we've got to wrestle with this morning as Christians. There is no such a thing as a sin too small to be worried about, because every sin carries consequence. And Lord, the frightening thing is that we don't even know what those consequences are. Many times we find out as we're going what those consequences were. May we take this seriously and examine our hearts and our lives before you. Pour our hearts out to you, Lord, and asking you to search us and try us. See if there be any wicked way within us. Lord, we pray especially for that lost soul this morning. They need to be saved. May this be the morning of salvation for them, we pray and ask in Jesus' name.